Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. We're, we're really thrilled to, to be here together. Uh, thank you to all those folks joining us via the live stream. Uh, I want to welcome everyone on behalf of the Overseas Space Realignment and Closure Coalition to the official launch of the coalition and to the launch of the coalition's letter to the Trump administration and Congress arguing for the closure of wasteful, damaging, and unneeded U.S. military bases abroad. I should say my name is David Vine. For those uh, who don't know me, I'm a professor of anthropology at American University here in Washington, D.C. Uh, everyone in the room should have a copy of the letter that we are sending to the Trump administration and Congress. If you're joining us online and don't have a copy of the letter, you can find it at our website, which is <coughs> www.overseasbases.net, <coughs> www.overseasbases.net. The coalition, or OBRAC, as we like to call it, has been working together steadily since the spring, and I'm excited that we have a chance to share our work and encourage others to join our coalition. In fact, I've been working on overseas bases for 17 years, and I think I've been wanting to be part of a coalition like this that spans the political spectrum uh, for about that long. Uh, our coalition and the 40 expert signatories to our letter include Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Greens, Independents. They include a retired Army General and other retired military officers, and Code Pink and other peace advocates, a former GOP member of Congress, and Noam Chomsky, Clinton, Reagan, and George W. Bush administration officials, and academic and think tank analysts with diverse political backgrounds. OBRAC is actually so diverse that at times it feels like we're in one of those jokes where a priest or rabbi and an imam walk into a bar, except in our case it's the Koch Foundation, Code Pink, and the Cato Institute walk into a bar. <laughs> it does. We actually haven't had any of our meetings in a bar, but maybe, maybe something for the future. Um, and we can work on a joke. Before I finish a brief introduction, let me say some quick thanks, though. I would thank all of you for joining us both in person and via live stream. Uh, thank you to our four really distinguished speakers, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, Dr. Catherine Lutz, Christine Ahn, and John Glazer. Uh, for those here in the room, both uh, Dr. Catherine Lutz and Christine Ahn will be joining us via, uh, remotely via the live stream. Uh, thank you also to all the people and organizations who've been involved in OBRAC for all our hard work together in organizing the letter in today's event. And I want to call out uh, and shout out, especially Kate, Ke Kate Kieser, Alan Vogel, Andrew Basevich, Barry Klein, Catherine Lutz, Sylvia Enlo, David Swanson, John Pfeffer, John Glazer, John Lindsay Poland, Joseph Gerson, Leah Bulger, Michelle Newby, Miriam Pemberton. Phyllis Bennis, William Ruger, Lawrence Wilkerson, and Bill Hartung, among others who've helped in numerous ways. And apologies to anyone uh, who I may have inadvertently overlooked. Uh, thank you also to the office of Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, uh, and especially to Alexandra Fox and Sam Goodstein for their help in reserving this room and making the meeting possible. I'm going to share some more details in a moment about OBRAC and the OBRAC letter, and then before turning things over to comments from our speakers, after which we'll have time for Q&A. If you're joining us by a live stream, you can ask a question by sending a message with the teleconferences chat feature. So please do feel free, and I'll try to monitor those as carefully as possible. There's some people who tell you that the right and left can't agree on anything these days. The Overseas Space Realignment and Closure Coalition has shown that people on the right, left, and at many other places on the political spectrum can agree on not just one thing, but on at least nine things. OBRAC has shown that in an era of bitter divisions between right and left, consensus is growing around a long overlooked but crucial part of how the United States engages with the world. The nearly 75-year-old Cold War era strategy maintaining some 800 military bases 
in around 80 foreign countries and territories outside the 50 states in Washington, D.C. The system of bases includes 194 base sites in Germany, 121 in Japan, 83 in South Korea, 44 in Italy. Others can be found in places including Aruba, Bahrain, Cuba, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Honduras, Iraq, Jordan, Kenya, Liberia, the Marshall Islands, Norway, Oman, the Philippines, Qatar, Romania, Saudi Arabia, Tunisia, the United Kingdom, and Wake Island, just to name a few. A few other nations have a very small number of foreign bases among them, uh, but with about 800 U.S. bases abroad, the United States possesses 90 to 95 percent of the world's foreign military bases. OBRAC and the letter we're releasing today reflect growing agreement among military experts across the ideological spectrum that reducing this excessive and outdated U.S. military footprint could counterintuitively make the country safer while saving billions, literally billions of dollars a year. The signatories to the OBRAC letter have different ideas about how many bases to close, which bases to close first, and how to go about closing them. But we find broad agreement with the following nine reasons to begin closing foreign bases and improve national and international security in the process. I'll very briefly outline the nine points of consensus, and we're happy to discuss any of the points of consensus in more detail in the Q&A. First, overseas bases are much, much more expensive than comparable domestic bases, even when a host country pays for some of the costs. Overseas bases cost ta taxpayers more than $50 billion a year and more than $150 billion a year if you include the costs of U.S. troops overseas. And I point you to our fact sheets, which not only has facts along these lines, but also careful citations documenting all the facts. And I think we, when thinking about the cost, the 50 billion alone, we should think about the opportunity costs. We should think about our crumbling domestic civilian infrastructure, our schools, our hospitals, our homelessness, our debt. Second, overseas bases entangle the US in wars. They, wait, they make war more likely, and they enable a reckless interventionist foreign policy. At least 23 times, U.S. bases have been used to launch wars of choice or military interventions in 14 countries in the greater Middle East alone since 1980, including in the catastrophic cases of Yemen, finally in the news, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Third, overseas bases are now largely obsolete thanks to technological developments. Today, the U.S. can deploy rapid response forces fast enough to be based in continental United States in almost all, if not all, cases. Fourth, and moving more quickly, overseas bases increase military tension with powers including Russia and China, which are encircled by hundreds of U.S. bases. Fifth, overseas bases support at least 40 dictators and repressive, undemocratic regimes that frequently host U.S. bases. Six, overseas bases cause blowback, including terrorist attacks, radicalization, and anti-American propaganda. Seventh, overseas bases damage the environment in a vast array of ways. Eighth, overseas bases damage the United States' international reputation and generate protests almost everywhere, like the decades seen decades of protests seen in Okinawa. Ninth, overseas bases cause harm to U.S. military personnel deployed abroad and to their families. Now, in terms of beginning to close some of the 800 bases abroad, it's important to note that compared to closing domestic bases, a process that many of you are probably familiar with, RAC, Congress does not need to be involved in overseas base closures. Presidents George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, and George W. Bush closed hundreds of bases in Europe and Asia. They should have gone even farther, and the Trump administration can now do the same. This would mean bringing home thousands of military personnel and family members to bases in the United States, 
where there was considerable excess capacity and where their paychecks would contribute to the domestic economy. That is, beyond saving money on the basis themselves, members of Congress have a strong economic incentive to want to bring these troops home to their districts and states. Meanwhile, it's of course important to know that local movements around the world, in places like Okinawa and far beyond, are demanding base closures or a significantly reduced US military presence. Importantly, as some of our speakers will discuss in just a moment, there are far more effective military and dip diplomatic alternatives to protecting national security and maintaining nearly a thousand overseas bases at a cost of tens of billions of dollars every year. Now, let me briefly introduce our speakers who represent some of the breadth of our transpartisan coalition and the people who have signed our letter, 40 experts on overseas bases who signed the letter. Although I should quickly note that there are yet more individuals who would have liked to have signed our letter but couldn't because their organizations don't allow signing on to set public letters or because in a few cases, people agreed with the vast majority of our points of consensus, but in one or two cases didn't agree, but are still willing to work with us. So our esteemed speakers, Christine Ahn is the founder and international coordinator of Women Cross DMZ, the global movement of women mobilizing to end the Korean War. Ahn is the co-founder of the Korean Policy Institute, the global campaign to save Jeju Island, national campaign to end the Korean War. Ahn is the former senior policy analyst at the Global Fund for Women, has worked with the Oakland Institute and Nautilus Institute for Security and Sustainable Development, among others. She's the author of The Revolution Will Not Be Funded and the co-producer of Fashion Resistance to Militarism. John Glazer, to my right, is director of foreign policy studies at the Cato Institute. His research interests include grand strategy, basing posture, U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East and the rise of China, among other topics. Glazer is the author of an important study on overseas bases, which those in the room can find at the back. Withdrawing from overseas bases by a forward deployed military posture is unnecessary, outdated, and dangerous. Glazer has been a guest on many television and radio programs. He's written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, LA Times, among others. Dr. Catherine Lutz, who you'll see in a moment by the, the live stream, is Thomas J. Watson, Jr., Family Professor of Anthropology and International Studies at the Watson Institute for International Studies at Brown University. Lutz is the author of numerous books on the US military and its bases and personnel, including The Bases of Empire, The Global Struggle Against US Military Posts, Homefront, Military City, and the American 20th Century, and breaking ranks. Dr. Lutz also co-directs the Cost of War Project at Brown University. Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, also to my right, is Distinguished Adjunct Professor, Professor of Government and Public Policy at the College of William and Mary. Colonel Wilkerson previously worked as Secretary of State Colin Powell's Chief of Staff and Associate Director of the State Department's Policy Planning Staff under Ambassador Richard Haas. Colonel Wil Wilkerson served 31 years in the U.S. Army. During that time, he was a member of the faculty of the U.S. Naval War College, special assistant to General Powell when Powell was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and director of the U.S. Marine Corps War College. And I should just mention about myself, in addition to being a professor at American University, um, I've written two books that I hope are relevant to the subject today, Base Nation, How the U.S. Military Bases Abroad Harm America and the World, and Island of Shame, Secret History of the U.S. Military Base on Diego Garcia. Without further ado, let me turn things over to John Glazer. Well, thank you, David, very much. Um, David has led this entire process. Uh, it's been really fun to watch him, uh, to lead it, and I didn't know or I had forgot that he spent 17 years on this stuff, and so but that clearly shows that he's passionate about the issue. Um, a lot of the things he mentioned, a lot of the things, the points of consensus on the open letter, a lot of the material that you can find in the back, I mean, there's, there are lots of solid arguments uh, against overseas bases that 
cost too much, they would take lots of wars, you know, they cause resentment and blowback and this kind of stuff. Um, and you can read up on all of those types of arguments back there, but it's also valuable to take a step back and, and look at it kind of more from a bird's eye view. Um, and I'm going to suggest that that's sort of worthwhile to do just for our understanding. So, um, you know, when the Cold War ended, um, our main geopolitical adversary just disappeared. That's another way of saying we got extremely more safe than we were. And yet, our behavior in the post-Cold War era has been one of hyper activity in terms of foreign policy. Really, really active and interventionist um, uh, to an, an absurd extent. So in the past 30 years since the end of the Cold War, we spent about $15 trillion on our military. It's an unfathomable sum of money that far exceeds what any other country in the world has spent. Um, since 1990, we have engaged in more individual military interventions than we had in the preceding 190 years of our existence as a nation. It's an extreme amount of hyperactivity. 40%, 46% of Americans have lived the majority of their lives with the United States in a state of war. 21% have lived their entire lives like this. Now, uh, you can also think of the incredible ease with which the executive branch of this country gets to deploy U.S. military force abroad. Uh, I mean, how many Americans are aware of the fact that we've been routine, routinely bombing Somalia for more than three years? It's hard to know that because we're bombing so many countries. Um, we've got active military hostilities in, I mean, the counts differ because the government isn't always uh, honest with you, but the counts anywhere from eight to 14 countries are engaged in active hostilities. So not all of these things are because we have a massive overseas military presence, um, but uh, our overseas military presence facilitates and enables this kind of hyperactivism. And uh, you know, I, I think back to the uh, scholar and nuclear strategist Bernard Brody, who long ago made the point that one way of keeping people out of trouble is to deny them the means for getting into it. And if you can imagine a situation where we had uh, a Congress that embraced its constitutional responsibilities to check the president's war powers, we could close down some of these bases and make it much harder for us to really, really intervene in every nook and cranny of the planet. Um, so overseas bases are not about protecting the United States. Okay? No overseas base protects you. Overseas bases are kind of like an insurance policy on stability abroad. Uh, they're supposed to deter adversaries in places far, far away from our shores. To deter Russia from getting, you know, causing trouble in Eastern Europe, to deter China from causing trouble in South China Sea. It doesn't tend to work because those countries get fear and they tend to act out against our attempt to contain them. Uh, but in any case, overseas bases are not about national defense per se. And that's important. Because the role of the military in our society is supposed to protect our country. And our overseas bases don't actually do that. Um, they're simply a physical manifestation of our grand strategy. Some people call this grand strategy primacy, liberal hegemony, deep engagement. There's lots of wonky names for it. But essentially, it's this idea that the United States needs to play the role of global peace. We need to uh, maintain global peace and stability. Uh, or uh, cause a lot of instability and war, uh, which is what we tend to do with these bases. Um, and so that's, that's really important, that they're just a reflection of our current grand strategy. Um, now, often they're just there to bolster the credibility of our security commitments. I mean, the United States is unique in the world. We're the only country in the world with more than 60 nations that were obligated by treaty to go and defend. Uh, and then we have a dozen or more tacit agreements with non-treaty allies that we can um, And so that requires a lot of overseas facing if you want to make those threats credible. But fundamentally, we will not see a shift away from this policy of forward deployment until we see a shift in our strategy, until we get away from this conception of the US role in the world that says we need to be globally engaged and militarily active in every region. 
So I'll, I'll stop there and, and wait for Q&A and, and go on to the next speaker. Thanks. Awesome. Um, uh, we will thankfully now break up this boys club in the room uh, with Dr. Catherine Lutz. Take us away, Kathy. Okay, great. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, very grateful to David Vine and, and the rest of the group for uh, getting us this far with, uh, again, an amazing document that represents the kind of uh, very unusual uh, coalition building and idea building that around the question of, of how to make a safer world um, via the cutting back on U.S. military basing overseas. Uh, the, the reason I've signed the letter and the, and the issue that I think uh, we, we are trying to highlight is that uh, these bases are often um, more harmful than beneficial, and in particular, they're, they become, in some cases, uh, in many cases, targets um, rather than uh, protected spaces. I think particularly of the island of Guam, where I've done research for many years and where uh, in the recent North Korean um, a U.S. saber rattling, uh, the people of Guam had to live uh, for, as they have many times in the past, with a sense that uh, they were about to be uh, become a target because of those military assets on the island, with very little warning. Um, forward bases have that problem uh, of, of being, um, again, often able to be attacked with little, little warning. Um, in fact, during the Cold War, uh, the the sort of dark joke was that nobody knew where the island of Guam was except targeters in the Kremlin. Um, and that's, I think, uh, an indication of the kind of uh, problem that's set up when we have places in so many places, um, which not only are targets, but often are provocative uh, and create local arms races in the way that uh, uh, was just referenced in the previous speaker. Um, I think the other uh, thing that makes me uh, very keen to see something like this really get taken up uh, by the administration is the, the cost, um, the $50 billion annual cost to have bases overseas rather than domestically. And again, our eyes usually uh, roll back in our heads as we try to figure out what, what this all means, millions, billions, trillions. Uh, but just to give you a sense that $50 billion annually is equivalent to uh, about half uh, half of that $50 billion would be the annual budget of the FDA, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, the National Science Foundation, and the WIC program. Uh, and then we'd still have uh, millions to spare. So again, the opportunity costs are, are substantial. And again, the idea of a national security policy that focuses on uh, uh, simply military policy rather than understanding that a hollowed out uh, domestic front is, is, uh, becomes less and less uh, uh, something that uh, we can see as, as having been benefited by, the, by this uh, security strategy. Um, in addition, I, I think um, many times, the, as, as again the previous speaker mentioned, uh, the bases are seen uh, in popular imagination and in the national security uh, establishment as uh, things which send a message. Bombs and bases send messages to our adversaries uh, and, and deter, uh, according to that popular belief. Uh, but whenever I hear that language of sending a message, I think of the importance of sending a message with uh, diplomacy. Again, some of that $50 billion should be redirected to a more effective means of communication of our, uh, of our intentions and our, and our national interests uh, than than through uh, overseas basing. Um, the State Department has really atrophied as, again, increasing numbers of dollars are spent uh, on this interventionist foreign policy that the bases uh, facilitate. Um, so that's, that's where I'll uh, uh, put my, um, my thoughts out uh, to you and, and, and look forward to questions. Fantastic, thank you, Kathy. And now we'll be joined by Christine Ahn, who was very nice to join us the last minute. Great, thank you. Christine, hold on one second, sorry.
Apologies. Now you can go ahead. Okay, great. Thanks, David, for having me. Um, I think it's plainly obvious why I signed on to the letter. I have a six-year-old daughter, and I'm increasingly anxious about our future in terms of not just growing instability caused by climate change, but as the letter states, the out-of-control deficit and military spending. We just cannot afford to continue on this path and has devastating consequences for our security here as Americans, but also on the lives of our friends and families around the world living near US bases. Um, I've traveled extensively throughout South Korea and met with South Koreans impacted by, directly by the US military and the bases, whether it's women who have worked around the US camp towns and sex brothels, uh, who were subjected to uh, really horrific, uh, gross human rights violations in terms of treatment. Um, I've met with farmers. I've seen uh, schools destroyed, community centers, homes, um, caused by the expansion of the largest U.S. military base in the world, Camp Humphreys in Pyeongtaek. I've heard from South Korean civilian groups who are very concerned about the environmental impact, whether it's the yeah. hidden burial of Agent Orange all throughout South Korea. But uh, one group uh, recently submitted a FOIA request about the Yongsan military base, and they found that from 1990 to 2015, there were 84 reports of toxic environmental contamination um, near and at Yongsan base, so which is in Seoul. So I'm here to give voice to those people who cannot speak directly to US lawmakers or to the American public. Um, as someone who has long worked for peace on the Korean Peninsula, there hasn't been a more fitting moment to be having this conversation. Most Americans don't realize this, but 2018 has been a banner year for peace on the Korean Peninsula, where the threat of nuclear war has been eclipsed by the prospect of finally ending the 70-year Korean War. Um, the two Korean leaders, South Korean President Moon Jae-in and North Korean Chairman Kim Jong-un, they've signed two historic agreements the Panmunjom Declaration and the Pyongyang Declaration. Um, they've set forth opening up a liaison office. So there's 24 seven, 365 days a year dialogue between the two governments. They've resumed family reunions, civil society engagements. They've demilitarized the border dividing Korea. Last week, we saw images that were tweeted virally um, of North and South Korean soldiers shaking hands of the DMZ. They've already begun to demine a portion of the DMZ. So this is happening. And as we also witnessed, Donald Trump met with Kim Jong-un. Clearly, there is a lot of work yet to be done between the US and North Korea. But in that Singapore statement, they committed to establishing new US DPRK relations in accordance with the desires of the people for peace and prosperity. So given the diplomatic breakthrough, the historic moment that we're in, this is the time now to be having this conversation. So thank you for um, allowing me to offer this point of view. Thank you so much, uh, especially for your joining us at the last minute. Now, let me turn things over to Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson. Oh man, did I. <laughs> I come at this from a slightly different point of view than the speakers you've heard, although I identify with the remarks they made in most cases. And my perspective was shaped as one of the principal strategists for the Army for a long time, dealing with one of the principal areas we had to deal with in the Middle East, which I like to call Southwest Asia, with my friends who are using Trey Tinkai and other Chinese diplomats appreciate it because it is Western Asia. The term Middle East is a bastardization of the British. You know, the middle about it is part of Asia. When you look at it that way, and then you go back to the time that was seminal for me with both Colin Powell as chairman of the Joint Chiefs and otherwise as strategic planner in the Pacific, for example, you understand viscerally some of the points that have been made. For example, Osama bin Laden made no bones about why he conducted 9 11. 
He conducted 9-11 because we had defiled the holy sites in Saudi Arabia by putting U.S. ground troops there. Now, whether you agree with that or not is irrelevant. He felt that way, as did Al-Qaeda and Amman al-Sawari, the brainchild of Al-Qaeda and others. For 40 years, U.S. military and security policy and foreign policy followed that, said unequivocally, we will not put bases in the Middle East under no circumstances because we understand the volatility of that region. We understand what might happen if we were to do that with 400 million Arabs, 70 million Persians, and so forth and so on. This is a very difficult region. We will do what we call at the time offshore balancing, which simply meant that Air Force assets carrier battle groups, marine amphibious groups, and so forth in the region, mostly in the northern Indian Ocean, would, if we needed to apply military power, do just that, and then leave. Never linger. Look at what we have today. The force laid down in the Middle East today is incomparable to anything we have ever done in any region since World War II. When Jim Mattis tells you that we shifted to the Indo-Pacific region, He's smoking something really low grade. <laughs> I read an article this morning from the New Yorker. It is potent, and I have to admit David's recitation of where we have bases. We now are building bases in Syria. And we have contractors in Syria providing hamburgers and Burger Kings. And we have airfields in Syria where jets take off. We built them. It's lucrative territory for the millions of dollars that are produced by contractors doing this for us. To give you an idea of how that has become so bloated in the first Gulf War that I was at hand for as a military officer, we had about 7,500 contractors helping us in Iraq. In the second Gulf War, we had 200,000. When war becomes so profitable across the board from Lockheed Martin, the world's largest defense contractor, and I call them merchant of death, which they are, to the smallest are going to be there. And they are going to be making money off of this. And that's what's happening in Syria. This New Yorker article, the article is beautiful because the guy goes up to one of the Marines and says, why are you here? And he says, I don't know. I'm just here, and I'm, I'm, I'm smoking a cigarette, I'm eating a hamburger, and drinking a Coke, and everything's Coke said. That's what we're doing. That very thing is what is costing us in polls, for example. Half the world's identifying us as the greatest threat to their future, whether they're talking about their state, as in Pakistan, or they're talking about their children, as in most of Southwest Asia. They think the United States of America is the greatest threat to their future. And that number is growing, not decreasing. I did bring one thing with me. I want to read it to you. It's from the American Conservative Magazine. And let me just say I agree with David. This is an incredible issue. Just like the issue I worked on yesterday and the day before, the Yemen War, and Senate Special Resolution 54, where we brought together all manner of people Thank you. That was a historic vote, and we're looking for the vote next week to even be more historic. Get us out of this brutal war that we are uh, complicit in with the greatest state sponsor of terrorism in the world, Mike Pompeo. You are a liar. You hear him the other day talking about how Iran was this and Iran was that. Every description of Iran that he made applies in tenfold. To Saudi Arabia. And not only that, we have a madman in charge of Saudi Arabia. Look at what he's done. He's brought the Turks, his greatest ideological enemy, into Qatar. Troops on Qatar soil now from Turkey. At one end, he's fouled his flank, and at the other end, he's fighting a war, brutally fighting a war, with food and humanitarian issues as his tools of that war. And he's losing. And we're with him. We're with it. And a lot of that is facilitated by the base structure that we have now built in the Middle East. Look at what we've done from where I was in 1984, 85, 86, for example, 
and where we are today. Largest military bases in the world. Gunner, LUD Air Base, largest U.S. air facility in the world. Bahrain, largest fleet headquarters in the world. And we have troops all over Kuwait. We have troops in Oman. We now have troops in Syria, allegedly to stay until the Iranians leave. That means forever. We have troops, of course, in Afghanistan. We have troops in Iraq. We have troops all over the area. And we are not making friends. Let me tell you, we are not making friends. This is what this base structure does. The other aspect of it that I'm really concerned with is the one that's been brought up here because when I started this process with Colin Powell at the end of the Cold War, when he was chair, the president had given us directions to close every single overseas base we did not need any longer. Well, the first thing we did when we looked at it was told him, if the Soviet Union is gone, why do we need about 90% of these bases? And I disagree with David on another point here. It's not a great disagreement, but you do need the Congress because they will marshal themselves against you, like John Murtha from Pennsylvania did, and Sam Nunn from Georgia did against us, if you are looking at a particular overseas base that they like. But you really got to get them on your side, and you got to get them forcefully on your side in some respects. I, I, I especially think it would be that way with the police. When we looked at this, we talked to foreign ministers and counterparts to Powell all across the world, from Australia to China, to Canada, Mexico. We said things like, okay, why do we have this base? Why do we have that base? Why should we do this? Why should we do that? In, the, in those conversations, we discovered that there were some people who were very concerned about our closing of base. One of, the, one of the particular countries in that regard was Australia. And the foreign minister of Australia at the time put it this way to Powell. He said, I have a lot more faith if a U.S. soldier is on the ground in, or Marine, take your pick, on the ground in Australia than I do if I see a carrier swinging at a mooring buoy off Perth. And Powell's argument at that time was very persuasive. The carrier swinging at the mooring buoy was a hell of a lot more powerful than a bunch of Marines or soldiers on the ground in Australia. But we understood what the foreign minister was saying. And so we wound up with a very small group of bases that we would retain and the criteria was something like this. One, essential to any strategic approach to a contemplated threat in that area. And here's the one that was really smart, I thought. A friendly population around the base. <laughs> that really limited our base structure. And we were hell-bent to go down to that. And of course, we were doing the domestic backgrounds too at the same time. Um, where we got derailed, let me read you this. The one constant in, re in recent U.S. foreign policy, regardless of which party occupies the White House, is that it prioritizes military intervention over all other instruments of national power. While President Barack Obama vowed to move the U.S. away from its, quote, perpetual wartime footing, unquote, by the end of his presidency, he had overseen the bombing of seven countries and had greatly expanded the drone war. In the last full year in office, the U.S. military dropped 26,171 bombs on seven countries, an average of 71 bombs per day. Let me conclude by saying I was invited to the White House to meet with President Obama in November of 2015, the last term, last year of the second term. We were supposed to spend about 15 minutes with him. General, Major General Paul Eaton and myself. He was thanking us for helping him get a very difficult joint comprehensive plan of action, nuclear agreement with Iran, essentially through a very difficult Congress. We spent 45 minutes with him, and the 45 minutes were taken up by the president, giving us a disquisition. The very opening sentence will live in my mind forever. 
quote, there is a bias in this town toward war, unquote. And the next 40 minutes plus were spent telling us that he had no idea what to do about it. Well, one of the things we could do about it is to begin to close this overseas space structure, which costs so much, facilitates war, and makes us think that everybody in the world is our enemy. Very much, Colonel Wilkerson, and thank you for all our fantastic speakers. Now we have time for, for questions. I, I can't really, uh, couldn't have even imagined that each of you would complimented each other so well. So I really want to thank all our fantastic speakers. Um, so questions both in the room and from the live stream. Well, I'd just like to remember uh, the president of Ecuador uh, who closed the U.S. base, and I think he said that, that he can, he, he, the United States can keep a uh, military base in Ecuador as long as Ecuador gets to have a base in Florida. <laughs> and so the United States had to move out. And we're, you know, hoping that would continue. Other countries will say goodbye. Um, the other, other things that I'd like to say, you know, people have been announcing working on this for 15 years, maybe longer. Uh, you know, how, how do we deny uh, those in power the ability to do these things? Your work, there are two things that I think of. Not from the Catholic work, right? Uh, denying the facility, trying to get young people not to join the United States military. That's one thing. And the other is that we, you know, we, we all have to be touched in our heart that we have to pay the tax dollars that are used uh, to do all of this, this stuff. That we need to, I mean, I'd love to hear all of us say, we will not, we'll put our money in diplomacy or whatever. We're going to tell these war makers that we're not going to do. And finally, I hold a sign at the Pentagon for years. 9-11 was an inside job to lead to war. So I, I'd like to say I'd love to talk to you about it. We, you know, I hear what you're saying about Saddam Hussein or Osama bin Laden. Uh, but uh, I, I have a different take on it. Other questions? I'll throw one out. Uh, my name is Pat Elder. I work with World Beyond War, and um, um, I have been uh, studying lately. Maybe one of our, one or more of our speakers would like to address the environmental damage caused by overseas bases in particular. Kathy, I know that's been yeah. that's part of your work. Yeah, uh, yeah the, the island of Guam is, is oh, a super fun I'll site. Second. Mm -hmm. saying it lost mm -hmm. audio. Okay, good. Try again, Kathy. Okay. Yes, hi. Um, in terms of the environmental impact of bases, it's it's quite uh, Extensive. I um, on the island of Guam. You have in your your packet uh, your the uh, or the website has the 
image of the third of the island of Guam, which is in military basing. But a much larger swath of the island has been impacted by U.S. Uh, military presence uh, in terms of uh, toxic uh, deposits on, in the soil, uh, contaminated water, um, uh, depletion of or salinization as a result of the uh, overuse of the water supply um, on Guam uh, by uh, a population that the island at this point can no longer support, even as more Marines are coming from Okinawa. So that, uh, that the island of Guam is a Superfund site um, has a lot to do with the fact that overseas bases are often treated uh, somewhat differently from domestic bases in terms of their uh, compliance with environmental protections. Um, but the, uh, the heavy industrial uh, operations of the contemporary U.S. military um, are, are often involve uh, various kinds of uh, cancer-causing, birth defect-causing chemicals, which when they make their way into water supplies and soil uh, and air are, um, again, deeply damaging to local populations. Uh, Guam is a Superfund site, uh, been it, still not cleaned up 25 years after it was so declared. So I think that's a, that's a very important consideration. Um, and uh, as, as we withdraw from these bases, our responsibility to clean up behind us, uh, as we did not do in the Philippines or in South Korea when we uh, moved bases or, uh, uh, or left. And I think that's uh, a real, again, moral stain on the United States as well um, that we have to consider when we look at uh, what these 800 bases and, and uh, including the wartime bases where environmental protection is, goes completely out of the window. Um, and I think that's, that's a significant part of the problem that we're trying to solve. Got another question here. Whoever was first.
and on entitlement. Because you have no money left. If we don't do something about that, we're in serious, serious trouble. So I think that's the angle of tax that the president is most, most concerned about. Colonel Wilkerson, uh, we got a question from online that I think link, links into that, and maybe you could just address it briefly. Uh, someone asked, are there me particular members of Congress that we should target to get on our side to uh, you know, avoid the kind of opposition you were talking about? That's a difficult question to answer now that you see what the House and who's the money in the House and what the looks like after the installation of the new Congress. But I know there are a lot of bets in that. I've talked to a lot of those bets, both Republican and Democrat. I know they're very concerned about two things, the physical situation and the constant war. And they want to put a stop to both. And so I think there is a possible ally in the GD coming into the House. And there are senators. I, I talked to Joe Manchin recently about the Yemen war. Jim Kane in Virginia a couple of years ago. Uh, Mike Lee from Utah. As you may have seen, Mike Lee has been Bernie Sanders' greatest partner. Again, this issue of war unifies all kinds of people, progressives, conservatives, liberals, you know, whatever you want to call them, everyone is sick and tired of this interminable war, as you pointed out so, so well. This is incredible what we're doing. It's awesome what we're doing. We, we look like Rome times 10. And we look like Rome times 10 about the time of Nero. This is not good. This is not good at all. Um, so uh, there are people who are beginning to understand this. And as we saw in that vote in Virginia yesterday, you can get the herd moving. <laughs> You know, that's hard, but if you get the herd moving, you can build a majority in the house. Thank you. I know Christine Ahn may have to leave us momentarily. Uh, so Christine, if you do, uh, we, we thank you and, and appreciate your time and, and effort. Uh, I know there's at least one more question here. turning these bases over to regular people, you know, areas where they're closing them. I mean, they're closing the bases and the competition rates, just as we're talking about here in the United States now. So, I don't, is there a, a law against military personnel getting their needs met when they're injured so badly from the environment? Happening to people on the bases and in the United States and in the world. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take one more question and then we're, because we're running out of time, perhaps our, our speakers could offer a few final thoughts, including about strategy moving forward.
So a couple questions, one about Okinawa, and uh, which also I think relates to policy and strategy choices moving forward, including the question of where, where to begin. Is Okinawa the place to begin? Do we begin elsewhere? So uh, let me address the Okinawa question. Very sad. Um, uh, David, could we? We can't hear. Yeah, I'm afraid I'm having trouble hearing David, so I I can't really comment um, on anything that was just said. I couldn't hear. Oh, I'm but, sorry. Uh, oh, but any, yeah. any final thoughts about strategy or any uh, and uh, priorities moving forward would be very helpful. And any final thoughts you'd like to offer? Well, I'm I'm co-director of a project called Costs of War, uh, and we have over the last. Uh, eight years been working to educate the public about the consequences of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And in doing that work, I've noticed that um, 
the attention that our, our expert reports get on the body count, uh, on things like the environmental impact, uh, impact on contractors who um, are often, uh, again, not treated with nearly the amount of care and respect as our veterans. Um, we don't get attention to those uh, papers or um, uh, media stories as nearly as much as we do to uh, the figure that we come out with annually on the total uh, budgetary cost to the federal government, which uh, just last earlier this month, we were in on Capitol Hill talking about our new $5.9 trillion figure. That wakes people up and, and gets attention. And it's, it's unfortunate that that's uh, uh, the case, but I think that is strategically an important part of what we're doing is, is talking about, uh, as Colonel Wilkinson said, uh, trying to survive as a nation, uh, which is increasingly indebted as a result of these very expensive military ventures over many decades and uh, trying to pair that back and it, financially, budgetarily, I think is, is, um, is the argument that we need to work with to start. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lutz. Thank you to all our speakers. We have run out of our allotted time, but I am incredibly encouraged by our gathering today. I encourage everyone to join us. Both, the, both those here in the room and those uh, viewing online, please do join us, get in touch. Check out our website where you can find out how to contact us, overseasspaces.net, overseasspaces.net. And please join us in this very important, as our speakers have shown us, very important struggle and effort to push the administration to begin closing bases overseas in the interest of both protecting national security, international security, and saving billions of dollars in the process that can go to pressing domestic and worldwide needs. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.